Hola, buen día. Lo siento mucho porque no puedo hablar mucho español, pero... Hi, my name is Shri Bose, and I'm so excited to have the honor and the pleasure of being here speaking with all of you today. Um, I have to say, over the past few days, I've been incredibly inspired and blown away by the respect and the priority that the leadership of Chile and the organizers of this event have placed on science and technology. I mean, we are in a world that's facing some really big problems, and science and technology are the way forward, and you really need that leadership, that backing from the world's leaders to be able to come up with solutions to those big problems. And I have to say, I was especially inspired by Madame President Bachelet's and uh, President-elect Piñera's um, willingness to get up and take their time to speak about the importance of science in Chile. Um, because I have to say, that, that kind of willingness to take the time, to prioritize science, to support it on this public platform, can really make the difference for the next generation of scientists and technologists in this great country. And I know that one from personal experience, because when I was 17, I was the grand prize winner of the first ever Google Global Science Fair. And the recognition I received from the leadership of my own country, the United States, actually set me on the career path that I'm on today. And so I just want to show you a little clip of that now. Because that next generation uh, is already coming. Uh, they're already knocking on the door. A couple of weeks ago, I got a chance to meet the winners of the Google Science Fair. Uh, I want to point out that all three of them were girls. Uh, and they had beat out right? they had beat out 10,000 other applicants from over 90 countries uh, so I had them over to the Oval Office and they explained their projects to me and I pretended that I understood uh, one of the winners uh, Shri Bose did her first experiment in second grade by trying to turn spinach blue uh, in fourth grade, she built a remote-controlled garbage can. And for this science fair, at the age of 17, she discovered a promising new way to improve treatment for ovarian cancer at 17. Uh, and she also told me very matter-of-factly that she'll be going to medical school and getting a doctorate, uh, and I suspect she will do so. Uh, she did not lack confidence. And it's, it's, it's young people like Shri, but also the people on this stage uh, who make me incredibly hopeful about the future. Uh, even at a time of great uncertainty, their stories remind us that there are still discoveries waiting to be made and unlimited potential waiting to be tapped. Uh, all we have to do is encourage it and support it. So I want to congratulate today's honorees for their extraordinary and inspiring work. Uh, we could not be prouder of all of you. And now it is my privilege to present the National Medals of Science and the National Medals of Technology and Innovation. So I have had the chance to do a lot of really fun, amazing things so far in my life. Um, and today, I'm excited to share a little bit of that with you, to tell you some of the lessons that I've learned from working at the intersections of way massively different fields and to tell you a little bit about the incredible intersections of progress that I see happening in today's world of science and technology. And today, I hope I can convince you to think a little bit differently about innovation and to recognize why creating these environments where creativity and innovation can thrive is incredibly important to our future. So today, I want to start off with a question for you. I want you to think back to your most recent innovation. It doesn't have to be something big or earth-shattering. It can be something that you created, that you looked at and thought, hmm, that was a creative way of solving that problem I had. In fact, I want it to be something simple. I think we often fall into this trap where we only recognize the really big things as innovations. We're only willing to brand our very best ideas as things that we meant to innovate. But that 
wasn't the way I was raised. My, my dad, who's here today, is an engineer. And so from a really young age, I realized that being an engineer, being an innovator, meant pretty much ignoring the limitations of the tools around you. My dad's a metallurgist, so that meant that if he needed a specialized little filter to be able to separate metal powders from solvents, he would use a coffee filter. If he needed a special type of brush to be able to, to paint a coating onto these small, complex shapes, he would use a makeup brush. And to me, that was innovation. Forget that coffee filters were meant for coffee. Forget that makeup brushes were meant for makeup. There was no such thing as meant for. And so growing up, this became a really ingrained notion for me. So much so that when I was 15 and my grandfather passed away of cancer, I started looking for those innovations in the world of cancer research. I wanted to find those people who were ignoring the limitations of chemotherapy and radiation and surgery. I wanted to find the people who ignored those limitations and found the cures, who found the things that could have fixed people like my grandfather. And at 15, I, I did what most 15-year-olds would do and went on Google and started reading everything I could find. I read conspiracy theories on different websites. I read scientific journal articles that I couldn't understand. And I just went through all of the material that was at my fingertips. And the more I read, the more I sort of realized that the innovations that I was looking for, those discoveries that I was searching for, those didn't actually exist yet. The questions that I was asking, the answers hadn't been discovered. And so at 15, I decided I wanted to be that person innovating in the field of cancer research. I wanted to be that person finding the solutions. So I started reaching out to professors in my area. I wrote these emails that started off with, hi, my name is Shri Bose and I am 15 years old and I want to do cancer research. And here's where I ran into a realization. Our society is built on a system of meant fors. It's built on the basis of research being meant for somebody with more experience, more knowledge, more training. Frankly, it's meant for someone older than 15 years old. The dozens of rejections I received from all the professors I reached out to made that part pretty clear. And it was one mentor, all it takes is one. There was one professor who was willing to overlook those limitations, who was willing to set aside the meant fors and really take a gamble on me, to really give me a chance to work in her lab. And in that lab, I did some work that would change my entire life. I worked with drug resistance in ovarian cancer, and in short, my project was about understanding why certain cancer cells stop responding to a chemotherapy drug called cisplatin. And what we found was amazing. We were able to show that this one energy pathway in the cell that has a central protein called AMP kinase is actually really important in how these cells become resistant. And if we target that pathway, that might be something we could reverse. And that would make chemotherapy more effective. So this was an amazing project to be working on as a 15-year-old. And from there, I got the chance to meet President Obama. I got to present at the Google Global Science Fair in 2011, where I was the grand prize winner. Um, I got the chance to go to Harvard, where I graduated from in 2016 with my degree in molecular and cellular biology. But one of the most amazing things that I got to do after this entire experience was actually to talk to students, to talk to kids who had that nagging notion of, I can't do research because it's meant for somebody with more experience, someone smarter, someone older. And it was really through talking to these students that I started really critically thinking about innovation. How how exactly is it that innovation happens? 
What sort of environmental things play into the inventions of tomorrow? And the more I looked around myself, the more I realized that the places where I saw the most exciting discoveries being made, the most exciting innovations happening, were really at these intersections of fields that in the past had been completely separate. Where you used to have biology and engineering, you had bioengineering. Where you had medicine and technology, you had medical technology. And that was exciting. That was something I wanted to be a part of. And so from there, I really structured everything I've worked on at the intersections of those fields that inspire me. In talking to students, I realized that there was this incredible lack of tools for kids to get started with learning and building with technology. And so I found a co-founder who was interested in gaming and how kids play. And together, we created this product called Piper, which is basically an electronics kit which allows kids to play the game Minecraft in the virtual world and actually build little pieces of hardware that let them interact with the game. It's this beautiful blend of bringing together how kids play, how they learn, and if you'd like to learn more about it, you can go to buildpiper.com. It's currently a $10 million company based out of San Francisco with shipping and sales all over the world. And as for, for my primary passions, my interest in science and medicine, I wanted to bring those two together too. I wanted to be the person sort of combining research at the lab bench, working with cancer cells in dishes, and being able to impact patients in hospital beds, like my grandfather was. So currently, I am a medical student at Duke University in North Carolina. I'm working on getting both my MD to become a doctor and my PhD to push forward those barriers of research. And I have to say, I, I hope I'll be an innovator in the future. In fact, I hope every single person in this room will be innovators in the future. But to do that, I think our definitions of innovation need to change a little bit. If you think about it, until pretty recently in human history, innovation was really this solo endeavor. You had the Leonardo da Vinci's, the Albert Einstein's, the Marie Curie's of the world who shaped entire fields of science with their contemplations, with their insights, and their names went down in history as these standalone geniuses. But our present world is very different. The entire extent of human knowledge is at our fingertips constantly. And so the most innovative things of our present come from collaboration. The most powerful innovations come from the combinations of different fields. They come from people like Atul Gawande, a Harvard surgeon whose insights into, in, into aviation, actually, showed that maybe using a simple checklist before surgery, like a similar kind that you would use before a flight, could actually reduce rates of medical error. It comes from people like Elon Musk, a physicist who's working on creating the solutions for climate change. It comes from people like Steve Jobs, a graphics designer who revolutionized personal computing. It comes from these people who really see the opportunities and apply them into fields where those innovations haven't been thought of before. So what does the future of innovation look like? We've talked about the past, we've talked about the present. What does the future look like? Well, I think it looks a little something like this room, actually. I think it looks like these forums of incredibly smart, passionate people coming together to share how they think, how they solve issues. So today, as you get up and walk around and talk to everybody next to you, and maybe you speak Spanish and maybe you, you communicate in English, but I want you to find people who are interested in vastly different things than yourself. I want you to find people who are passionate about completely different fields. If you're an educator, go talk to somebody who sits at a lab bench. If you're a politician, go talk to a marine biologist. Ask them how they would solve the problems of your field. 
Because this right here, Congreso Futuro, is an environment of innovation. This is where we start talking about the world's big problems. And this is where we start coming up with solutions. Thank you.